All right, welcome everybody. Um, thank you for joining the University of Northern Colorado Alumni Career Panel on Careers in Brewing Science. My name is Lindsay Crum, and I have the privilege of serving as UNC's Assistant Vice President for Alumni and Community Relations, and I'm joined by some wonderful UNC alumni who are going to share their experience in the brewing industry with you. If you're really clued into brewing, um, like most people are in Northern Colorado, you know that this is an exciting and growing industry, and UNC has for many years offered a certificate in brewing science, so we're excited to see a lot of our alumni go through this program, either as returning students, um, as employers, as mentors, um, or as a first-time student. So know that there are some great resources available if you'd like to enter this profession by joining UNC's academic community, but you can also learn more about the profession by meeting our alumni that work in it every single day. Um, so this conversation today will be recorded. We will have a link available through our YouTube channel, but also on the alumni career site. I'll post a link in the chat for all of you later. Um, it will be available in a week from our live recording. Today is April 6th, so you'll see it next week. Um, if you have questions for any of our panelists, please know that the Q&A feature in chat is available for you. I will also be putting the contact information for all of our alumni in the chat, so anyone watching live will have a chance to connect with our folks and really put that bare network to work. What we're going to do today is I'll ask each of our guests to introduce themselves a little bit about their background. I'll turn it over to Sean, who is our program representative from Brewing Science and a UNC alum, to facilitate today's conversation. And so with that, how about we start with Jeff, if you'd like to go first. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I'm Jeff Crabtree, uh, the owner and founder of Crabtree Brewing Company and uh, an 05 graduate with a business economics degree. Wonderful. Shade, would you like to go next? Hi, my name is Shade. Um, I graduated from UNC in 2017 with a degree in English and then came all the way back um, to do the certificate in brewing science, which I finished in December of 22. Um, I currently do a lot of cellar work at Peculiar Brewing Company, we just rebranded, um, and Purpose Brewing and Cellars in Fort Collins. Wonderful, thank you. Sarah, how about you next? Hi, I'm Sarah. Um, I currently work at Denver Beer Company as a brewer. Um, I graduated from University of Northern Colorado in 2021 with a degree in graphic design. Wonderful. Wonderful. Sure, how about you? Um, I'm Sean Johnson. I graduated with my uh, degree in chemistry in 2014 and then did some research on brewing chemistry for my master's degree, um, which I got in 2016 and kind of went into industry for a little bit, but stayed connected with the brewing program in its infancy, really, and came back to be one of the instructors and am now the program manager for the Brewing Laboratory Sciences program uh, that is offered here at UNC. Wonderful. Thank you. And thank you to the four of you for joining us today and sharing your experience and your expertise in this industry. I'm going to go off camera and turn it over to Sean to facilitate the conversation. Enjoy. All right. Thank you. Um, so I have some questions here to ask amongst the panel, and I guess I'll just kind of dive right into it. I'll ask a question and then I'll kind of hand the microphone over to uh, whoever I guess, if you will, we all have microphones, but I guess we'll unclick the mute button. Um, so the first question I have here is, how did your UNC experience help you launch into your career and arrive at your current role? Uh, Jeff, we can start with you. Absolutely. So uh, as most students, I didn't really know what I wanted to do when I wanted to grow up. And uh, I took an economics class and it just spoke my language. And as I progressed through my economics minor, or excuse me, major, I, I did take some business classes and just-in-time inventory and inventory management accounting really spoke to me as well, which I've always known that I've been a manufacturer and I like the manufacturing realm. I also enjoyed the beer manufacturing realm, but knowing that I was about to start a career in the craft brew industry, I was really able to tailor the last years of my classes to really launch into the craft scene. I graduated in uh, December of 05 and four months later I opened a, my craft brewery. I really took a lot from my education, uh, specifically in 
um, the manufacturing just in time inventory management side of it. But the University of Northern Colorado was a great launching pad to to really add value knowledge to my toolbox to really start a successful craft brewery. Awesome, I will um, ask the same question over to Sarah of how did your UNC experience help you launch into your career and arrive where you are now? Cool, yeah. Um, I joined the Brewing Science program back in 2017 or 2018, um, and I slowly started going through the courses. I did about one course a semester, which was cool because I got to meet so many more classmates who um, are now in the industry. So I feel like I have a great network of people in the industry currently working. Um, towards the end of my program or towards the end, end of my finishing the program, I started doing some internships. So I interned at Rick's Brewing um, in Greeley, which was a great opportunity to kind of start learning about the whole brewing process hands-on. Um, and then I did a second internship at Broken Plow Brewery, which is now Rule 105 Brewing. Um, there I got to do um, more of like a brewer assistance role, which was great. I got to work with an amazing brewer, um, learned so much from him. And after I did a few brews with him, one of my professors came and brewed with me. And he actually recommended for me to look into a brewery, Eddie Lyme Brewery in the mountains, um, that they were looking for someone from our program. Um, I was super eager at this opportunity, um, so I went for it, and thankfully I was offered the opportunity, and from there I've just fallen in love a little bit with the production side of the brewing world, so I moved from Eddie Line to Oscar Blues, where I've now found my home at Denver Beer Company, um, and I'm excited to see um, where my path will continue to go in the um, production side. Awesome. And before I talk about myself, I'll ask uh, Shade to uh, tell their story as well. Yeah. Um, so my my path to brewing was actually really on on non conventional um, because I actually worked in higher education for quite a while before arriving into brewing. But one of the major things that I benefited from was that. I was able to take a lot of my courses uh, in the certificate program while I was full-time employed at the university. So I got to be a part of the community and also go through with my education. Um, and then towards the end of uh, the program, I had to complete an internship. Um, and so I got to do that with my friends uh, who are over at Peculiar. It, I, <laughs> it was not planned. I wasn't going to originally do it there. Um, but one day uh, they they were at Weldworks, uh, Kurt and Suze, who are like the managers. And I was talking about like, oh, I like I need to figure out where I'm going to get my internship hours done. And they were like, here you go. Come do it here. And I was like, OK, so I did. Um, and then I ended up staying after um, after the fact. So the internship component of the program was really what uh, gave me a leg up and in getting into the my first full time position. And then with purpose. Um, it's kind of the same thing. I'm friends with the owners and suddenly they were like, we need help with barrels. So I did that. Um, but I would say ultimately uh, that the the program, the certificate program, um, having that like component of like hands on experiential learning was really what got me a foot in the door because otherwise, you know, my resume is all education. And so like what production facility is going to hire me unless I'm going to come and lecture at them. So I got really lucky in that regard. Great stories. And for myself, um, I was doing my chemistry undergraduate degree at UNC back in 2012. And I remember the chemistry department as well as the biology department, just um, the departments across Ross kind of helped me get into internships because much like Jeff, I had no idea what I was going to do when I was grown up. Um, and so I went and I worked and did an internship in pharmaceuticals and didn't like it at all. And then I went and did an internship in um, natural product refining and didn't like it at all. And then my junior year, um, Dr. Mosher, who is the um, professor who started the brewing program here at UNC, uh, offered just a random high-level chemistry class of the chemistry of brewing. And I took that and 
just became really interested in the science behind beer and brewing and fermentation um, enough so that when I graduated, I asked him, could I do my master's research on, you know, chemical reactions and brewing? And he said, if you find a good chemical reaction, sure. So I spent, you know, better part of two weeks looking through journals and finding reactions that I could study. And that's what I did for my master's degree was continue just to study beer. And so that opportunity that I was just in the right place at the right time, but the facilities at UNC were there to offer me a class that really piqued my interest in a topic that I was really interested in that I didn't know I'd have interest in. Um, and then I just kind of stayed involved with Dr. Mosher and, and uh, you know, chatted with him about, you know, from the student's perspective of what would be interesting in terms of a certificate. And then after the certificate happened, uh, the minor, which now exists as well, and kind of my involvement just drew me back when there was an opportunity to come back and I've been here um, pretty much ever since. Um, but enough about my stories. I've, I've got another question here that I will pass along, um, which is uh, name one to one to two leadership or customer service practices that you have incorporated into your work that have helped you move forward into your career. And we can start with Sarah. Thanks. Uh, I'll start with a customer service um, thing. One of my favorite things to do is like wander out of my brew house environment and wander into the tap room side of things and start talking to customers. See what they like about our beers. See what beers they keep coming back for. See what beers they would like to see on the tap list. Um, see what they're enjoying from other breweries. Um, if I have the time or they have the time, it's really fun if we can wander back to the brew house together and we can do a tour and show them the brew deck, um, kind of go over a quick understanding of the brew process if we have time for it. Um, sample a beer from a bright tank so they can taste um, a super fresh um, carbonated beer. Um, so that's one of my favorite customer service skills to use in this industry. Um, for a leadership skill, I think the program at UNC did a really good job at teaching me a lot of um, more managerial tasks that the brewery might ask of me. Um, creating standard operating procedures was one of the assignments that stuck with me most from the program and I have now been able to apply at my jobs here and I've been able to um, completely standardize and rewrite um, standard operating procedures for um, the breweries I've worked for or just help in the process of investigating if there's a better way or experimenting with different um, thought processes of how to get to the final solution. Is there a quicker, more efficient way? Um, is there a safer way to do it? Um, so I think that's one of my favorite things that I learned at UNC was how to do standard operating procedures and things of that like um, that can help me lead a team. Same question. Great answer, by the way. Um, all of my students dislike when I make them write SOPs, but I promise I do it uh, for future benefit. But same question over to Shade. Oh, those dang SOPs. I, <laughs> I was just laughing because I was like, yep, yeah, that's the part that stuck with me the most, too, because I rolled into Peculiar and I was like, so how do we do things? And they were like, you just do them. And I'm like, oh, okay. And I was like, well, the good thing is, is I have to write all these SOPs. So like, let's standardize the process, um, which I still get to do. Um, and Purpose doesn't have any SOPs. So I'm just out here utilizing that very well-learned skill <laughs> um, every day. Um, so like, yeah, I agree with what Sarah said that uh, at that particular assignment was extremely beneficial. Um, and also I agree with the idea too of learning a lot of the managerial tasks. Um, See, I'm always looking at cost effectiveness and like, like, for example, I had this, this recipe that used mostly Pilsner malt and then like a little bit of dextrin malt and the dextrin malt didn't really do much. So I was like, could we just like cut that malt out and just make it less expensive or like vice versa, you know? Uh, Cause sometimes you like brew a recipe and you use fun things because it sounds cool. And then you get there and you're like, well, that malt didn't offer anything to this beer, except for like maybe a slight roastiness or something, you know, like. So if you're able to like cut back on um, recipes or like ingredients and stuff, that's always good for cost. Um, like customer service, sometimes I get, 
sometimes I get thrown into the, the throes of the tap room. Um, so I always have to be able to navigate customer interactions. Um, but your customers are like the best resources when it comes to knowing what beer you should make next. Because if you are talking to people and like a certain style is selling, if your neighborhood uh, friend brewery, friendly breweries in your area are like selling a specific style, like being able to discuss with customers like what they are looking for or like what they like about a beer. That's a great way to, it's like a market study and just being able to do that um, and build those relationships with those clientele and like having that one customer who's going to walk up to you and be like, dude, this beer's trash. I'm like, you know what? <laughs> I don't have feelings, but thank you. <laughs> um, it, just like being able to have that good cordial relationship um, and building that audience is really critical. Um, but yeah, so I think that ultimately just like the managerial skills that I learned through this program and just being able to build relationships is like my top two uh, favorite things that I'm able to do every day. Jeff, do you have anything that you would like to add as well? Absolutely. I love hearing both of your stories. SOPs, I always think of, is that like a Subway sandwich or something? Uh, because I was not trained in the SOP world. So when, when I started the brewery, it was fun to, to really start training new brewers and say, this is how we do things. Follow what I do. Ah, SOPs. So I'm really happy to hear that you guys have been well-versed with that. So good job, Sean, making sure that happens. And customer service, I love how you brought that up as well. Talking to your customers is so key because we can, we can scour the internet and look at beer reviews, but it's on a micro level, you really being that neighborhood tap house and that, that local regional brewery, you need to understand what's really happening in the marketplace and talking to the people who are buying your beers are the way to do it. Um, one of the big things that I do for my team and myself is continued education. Like always read up, always sharpen your, your, your toolbox, because there are things that I'm still learning today after being in the industry for 20 years that, boy, I wish I would have known how to do that. Well, now I do because out of necessity, I've had to figure it out. Um, but continuing that education and really uh, the university offers some other adjunct classes to, to really tap into, to really further that along. Uh, running just-in-time inventories, just running the business day-to-day -day operations and even the HR. How, do, how is all of these wonderful humans in this organization going to communicate together successfully and make those customers happy. So that's great. But SOPs, if you guys need more practice, you can come over to the brewery and I'll uh, give you some SOPs that need to be done. I was just about to say I'm available for contract hiring. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't really have uh, too much to add on top of what you guys have already said. It's been great answers. So uh, we'll jump over on to question number three. And as a reminder to anyone watching, um, if you do have any questions, feel free to use the Q&A uh, portion of the Zoom and ask your questions. We'll go ahead and try to answer them um, as they come up. But moving on to the next question I have here, um, as students look to begin a career in brewing and with the knowledge that UNC's program has a focus on the quality control and quality assurance sector, how have you seen our graduates make an impact on the quality of the beer at the companies they work for? We'll go ahead and start with Shade. Yeah, I mean, honestly, uh, QC and like that is such an important part of being able to um, have a successful beer go out into the market. Um, I know I can only speak from my personal experience and keep in mind, I'm relatively fresh into the full time brewing situation. So other people might have more extensive answers, but just even a way that I've been able to be a part of that is. Uh, tasting our beers during the fermentation process. And then again, before we release them, um, because if you are get trained in off flavors and knowing exactly like uh, what you're tasting as you're examining a beer, you're able to catch imperfections and flaws that might mean the beer is like not servable. So as an example, um, at Peculiar, we had a beer, I think it was like in January or February that had accidentally gotten oxidized. So it was exposed to oxygen for uh, too long and the beer tasted like cardboard or uh, paper, which is typically the flavor associated with oxidation. And my manager didn't catch it because he um, was away for the weekend. And we, I came on, I came in on that morning to package the beer and I was tasting it. And I was like, you know, guys, like I, there's just something wrong with this. I think that we need to like fail the beer. I don't think that we should package it. Um, so like 
me bringing that up was what allowed us to prevent that beer going onto the market. Um, and making sure that your beer is always good is really important, especially uh, if you're distributing. If somebody sees your beer at like the liquor store, like wherever you want to buy your beer, um, and they try it, and that's their first impression of the company, that's a customer you might have just lost forever. Um, so like, that's just my personal thing. I always say that as human beings, we might not be perfect, but the beer we produce can be perfect if we do everything the right way. Um, but yeah, so like, that's, that's my one little example of how I was able to utilize my knowledge of off flavors, which is part of quality control um, and quality assurance with, that I learned in the program. Jeff, I'm sure you have one or two uh, things that you could add about quality. I do. I do. I want to first start by saying I've had a lot of opportunities working with a lot of brewers from different programs throughout the country. And the one thing that I really, really love about the program at my own college is the QC side. I can train anyone to be a brewer, but to run a lab and do QC work is beyond valuable. I'm a businessman. I can run a pivot table like a pro and I can do a COG analysis with consumables until, well, until I don't want to do it anymore. But one thing I don't like to do is lab work. But lab work is the most important thing in my industry. Being able to produce a product and repeat that product, regardless of your own feedback, it's, is crucial. Uh, be it the, the IBUs, the SRMs, the ABVs, there's, the list can go on. But being able to run or have, in my particular case, someone to run a QC program is invaluable. And uh, the program at the university really does that. And I'm really thankful for that. Um, without such programs, you nailed it. You just don't produce a sellable product. And then that product damages the brand. And now you're swimming up water upstream. It just doesn't pan out like it should. So keep that QC up and sharp and you'll be successful. And Sarah, would you like to round us out on this question? Yeah. Um, Jeff said that it's lab work is so important. And it's one of my favorite things of the job because as an art student, it's where I get to pretend I'm a scientist. Um, so I love that part of it. But during my time at Eddie Lime Brewery, um, my, one of my first managers when I first started there, she had actually started um, a sensory analysis program and she was one of the students who went through um, the program at UNC. Um, when it came time for her to leave, um, she had a pretty established sensory program at um, Eddie Lime. We were tasting all of our beers before they were packaged. Um, we were tasting them after they were packaged. Um, it was really cool. We were able to experiment with the shelf life of the beer. So we had a very confident answer of when our beer was no longer tasting um, in spec the way we wanted it to taste. Um, and we were able to then figure out once we knew what our shelf life was, can we get this shelf life better? So we were able to keep experimenting with other things in the brew house um, to get that short that shelf life as long as possible. Um, once she left, I was given the opportunity to take over her sens sensory analysis program, which was so fun for me. I was able to teach my staff or my staff, my coworkers and our taproom staff um, how to essentially be tools for me. I taught them how to taste off flavors. Um, we would spike beers with off flavors so we knew what they tasted like, what we were looking for in beers. Um, and from those classes, they were able to become my tool. And then it was amazing. They were able to tell beers that were just a week apart. Um, the consumer might not be able to tell beers that were a week apart, but they were able to tell um, beers that were brewed a week apart. So that was so fun to see people go through, learn from me, and then see them implement it in their work. And sometimes they would find beers in the market that we pushed out and they would bring it back to our attention and say, can we look at this batch number um, from our sensory database and see if this was a one-off with this can or if we need to look more into this batch and see if there's more we can do for it. Um, so I love being in the sensory world. 
like I said, pretending to be a scientist is my favorite part of the job. Yeah, and I would say that one of the things we really emphasize with quality in our program is just the the notion that quality is a mindset, not necessarily just something that you do when you have to do it. Um, I've talked to a lot of breweries in the industry, and I've talked to a lot of um, people in quality from very small breweries up to very large breweries. And the thing that I'll find when it comes to beer consistency is that beers are the best versions of themselves and the most consistent and the most true to the brand when it's in full buy-in by the whole company from the top down into quality that it's not just okay we pushed the button and we got the numbers but everybody understands why are we looking at these numbers and why are we measuring these things and why is this important to track and how could this affect the beer which would then affect the brand and affect the company as a whole and i think that when you look at quality assurance and quality control kind of on the outside a lot of people just see a bunch of people in a lab pushing buttons and just getting numbers and the importance of understanding that the deeper aspect of that being that it, we're not just training uh, people how to, you know, get numbers. We're, we're training students how to go into the industry and help instill this mindset of quality and this mindset of what's important when you're trying to um, produce good beer. And one of the things I tell a lot of my students, if you go to a brewery, odds are they have their brewer already because they make beer and so they've already got that part figured out so i tell them what you know what additional value can you bring and a lot of that is the quality alongside whatever their major might be if they're pursuing the minor is you know they bring along this idea of quality and these ways to implement quality along with whatever their expertise might be in their graduated field and that brings in a heck of a lot more value than just the person who wants to be the bartender or wants to be the brewer and having the knowledge of the brewing process and all of those other things is helpful, but so are so many other things that you can add to your resume as you enter into the industry. Um, all right, let's go ahead and jump on to our next question here, which is, how do you build or strengthen your networks? Why is networking or relationship building important in your work in brewing? And we'll start with Jeff. So before we jump into that question, to tag on to your last um, your feedback. Um, we also at the brewery have a scholarship program for any of those non-chemistry biology majors, because I think that it's also very important to be able to run a business, but also who are interested in the QC program, get a hold of that scholarship, because I need to see more business majors and minors getting interested in the QC side of the brewing industry. Um, and that really ties you back into the, the question you just asked, Sean, uh, the networking side, the strength of our network is only as strong as our relationships. And so if there's something that I can't get our lab to do, or if, there, if I need help, I know that I can reach out to Avery Brewing Company or New Belgium. And making sure that we have those type of relationships are really important because we're all here together uh, to, to really create a solid product for our consumers, uh, regardless of the brand that we are. And having that relationship and being able to have that network is key. Monthly, we reach out and talk to each other. And there will be times that something goes wrong in my brew house. And I've got to reach out to another brewer for assistance. You don't have to isolate yourself. Having that communication and that relationship is vital. Uh, and I'll pass along the same question over to Sarah. Yeah, I think networking is like super important in this industry. One of the things that drew me to this industry in the first place was how big this community is and how sharing and open this community is. We're all in it together versus against each other is how I feel. And I really love that. Um, kind of as Jeff was saying, like, if we forget to order hops, we can reach out to a brewery up the road. They probably have hops on hand for us. We don't have to push off our brew day. And then um, I have recently joined um, Pink Boots Society, which has been a great opportunity to meet more um, women in the industry. Um, I often don't meet many women in the industry. So joining organizations that kind of um, tailor to me and my style of brewing has been great um, 
to meet more people, but it's important to keep those connections again so that um, that community stays as strong as it is right now. And uh, toss it over to Shade. Yeah, um, honestly, the Pink Boot Society is literally like the main way that I've networked because I joined uh, Pink Boots a couple years ago when I was bartending at Weldworks. Um, and that community is just full of so many really awesome people. Um, and Pink Boots is not just for women, it's for any non male identifying person in the industry. So uh, non binary folks, like gender fluid, anywhere in between, like you are welcome in that space, you're encouraged to be in that space. Um, and the Pink Boots Society also offers a lot of educational components and scholarships to um, attending different summits. So they did one for like uh, the Yakima Hop Summit, uh, where you fly out uh, to the valley and like do hop ruts and like learn about the crops for that year. Uh, they also have scholarships for CBC, which is the Craft Brewers Conference. This year it's in Nashville, so I'll see you all there. Gonna eat some hot chicken. Um, and then I also um, am pretty involved with like the Brewers Association. So I'm doing the Brewers Association mentorship program right now. And basically it's like a 12 week program where they pair you up with somebody who um, has been in the industry for a while. So my mentor, his name's Eric, and he is the owner and founder of um, Oh Cahaba Brewing, which is in Alabama. And he is just so cool. And we're able to learn a lot from one another because I'm fresh out of school. So I have um, some more recent knowledge and he's been brewing for 15 years. So we're really able to like tag team um, our mentorship program. But ultimately, I think just making friends with your local breweries is just so incredibly important. I was kind of chuckling at Sarah's comment about the forgetting to order hops because there was a moment where we forgot to order a specific bag of grain and we were in Windsor. And next thing you know, I'm like, I'm going to Weldworks. I'm sure they have it. I was like calling them like while I was driving there. And I was like, hey, Skip, do you happen to have any like rolled oats or like like rolled wheat or whatever the heck it was? And he was like, uh, yeah. And I was like, can I give you $50 for it? Cause like I'm on the way there and I really need it. Cause otherwise I can't mash in. And he's like, sure. So I like drove down there. I bought it from, from Weldworks. It was great. Um, the bit being able to have those relationships is just invaluable. Uh, like we're all out here trying to learn and help each other. So, you know, just make friends. So fun. Yeah. And, and going into also the stories of just the industry being a very friendly industry, uh, last September, um, uh, we have the Bears, Brews, and Bites, which is the on-campus beer festival. And one of the breweries showed up, uh, and their whole setup to serve beer was all set up, but somebody had just left their carbon dioxide tank open at some point with a leak. And so they went to go pour beer, and it there was no carbon dioxide to push the beer. And I would say within... This probably had to be about 30 minutes before the beer festival started. Within 15 minutes, the other breweries at the festival there had been able to figure out who had a spare tank and who had somebody working to bring it. And before the festival started, they were right as the festival started, they had it fixed and up and running. So, I mean, even just at festivals, it's just it's a friendly industry with a lot of friendly people. And there's not a lot of cutthroat, you know, businesses trying to um, just. I don't know, best one another, I guess. It's it's just a very friendly competition, not a not a rude one. Um, but let's go ahead and uh, jump ahead to our next question here, which is, uh, would any of you be willing to share a difficult lesson you learned through your career path? And how might students avoid learning this uh, difficult lesson the hard way? Uh, we can start with Sarah. Um, one of my favorite lessons I've learned, um, it's really just a fun story to tell, is paying attention when you take your tri-clamps off. So you take the right tri-clamp off and you don't accidentally take a valve off of a tank and explode beer all over the brewery. Um, that's never a fun day, but it is a fun challenge, I guess, um, if you want to try to push a valve back on a tank blowing beer out at you. Um, I've it's not a mistake you see often, but it's a mistake that does definitely happen. Um, so that's one of the first lessons I learned was pay attention to which clamp you are taking off and if it will explode beer outside of the tank. 
Yeah, I, uh, in a similar note, my, my scenario with that was putting beer into a bright tank, which is the tank that holds the beer before you carbonate it. And usually you put what's called a carbonation stone in the bright tank, which is what you push the gas through to fill it up. And we filled up the bright tank and didn't put the carbonation stone in. So we had to actually purposefully take off the tri-clamp. <laughs> and I remember standing there with the seal <laughs> and Dr. Mosher had the... Uh, um, uh carbonation stone and i just pulled it back and he put it in as fast as he could we probably lost about a gallon and a half of beer maybe i like to think that we were pretty good at it but um that's just kind of my that reminded me of that story that i think a lot of us who have been around beer production have at least seen that um i'll ask the same question about the difficult lesson uh and stop talking about my own stories here for a second and i'll pass it on to uh Shade. Oh, I can't believe you forgot the carb stone. That's how embarrassing, Sean. <laughs> that's, that's really funny. Um, so I feel like I have a few, but I'm, gonna, I'm trying to figure out which one I want to pick. But, um, you know, if you haven't given yourself a beer shower at least once or twice, are you actually brewing? Like, you got you to get it on you at least a few times. I think for me is do not utilize a piece of equipment if you are not fully aware of how it works. Because... Um, that remember that beer I talked about that ended up getting oxidized. I'm going to tell you how it happened. So my, uh, the lead R and D brewer, Andy and I had just received a brand new adjuncting vessel, sparkling new, we passivated it, which basically, you know, just getting it ready to like hold beer. Um, and we like purged all the, like all of the oxygen out of it. And then it came time to use it. And we, <laughs> have never used a diaphragm pump before. So we weren't entirely sure how that works. So we're both sitting there watching YouTube videos, trying to figure out how to use a diaphragm pump. And the whole thing that we were trying to do was we were trying to uh, dry hop this beer by having the hops in the adjunct vessel and the beer come in and like recirculate through the tank. This was Andy's idea. I was along for the ride. I was like, sure, it sounds fun. Let's do it. Um, it did not work at all did not work mostly because what we didn't realize is at the bottom of the tank in the in the cone there was like a little screen that's supposed to keep the hops or like whatever like your fruit, fruit puree whatever fun things you're about to adjunct the beer with um it's supposed to keep it from getting into the cone but we didn't know that that was even a thing that was down there because it had been open the whole time when we received it and we had kept it open to passivate it and to purge it and we didn't realize that all the hops were stuck in the cone and they were dry and compacted. <laughs> um, and we couldn't get the beer to get out of the tank. So, you know, we had to like get creative. Um, so all that to say is you should practice using the equipment on like water before maybe trying to use it with beer and then ending up having to, to you know, dump, dump a whole batch of beer. Um, but yeah, that's my embarrassing oops story. And Jeff? pass it to you so there's there's a lot of stories over 20 years but i think the the biggest things that i've learned the hard way is uh, making sure that you're in a leadership fashion watching cost of goods sold making sure that you are watching the bottom line uh, people are great uh, but watch the labor dollars that you're spending um, you can, the margins are tight in the production facilities. And if you're not on top of how much are you spending in products, how much are you spending in COGs, you can lose that margin pretty quickly and it's hard to recover from. And so having a, a solid, solid data system that you can watch and track will keep you out of the mud and keep you in clear water where you need to operate all the time. Another item is HR. HR is a big thing for me, having that open communication with employees and staff and making sure we're all on the same page about our goals and our mission statement and where we're headed to will help us uh, maintain a successful facility. And there were years that I just kind of said, okay, we'll just wing it. And that bit me in the butt several times. Um, people not happy. Uh, that equated to not producing solid products that we were happy about. And so um, keep uh, keep a tune to the business side of the brewing and uh, 
hopefully you'll keep out of those beer baths. Yeah, um, I think those are all very good pieces of advice. I do have uh, one last question here um, that I wanted to ask, but I'm going to tag my own um, my own personal question to the end of it, just to surprise everyone here at the end. Um, so the final question is, can you provide a final word of advice to uh, UNC Bears currently seeking a job in brewing or brewing sciences? And then after you answer that, I just want to tag on, does anybody have anything that they're excited about beer wise, either that you're making that you know is coming out, something that's happening that's exciting for you, then that isn't the Craft Brewers Conference in Nashville, because that's an answer that's cheating, um, because everybody is excited about that if they're going. So I'll just kind of pass those two questions along to to everyone is any advice you might have for students uh, looking to get a job and then just what are you excited about that's happening in the beer world here coming up soon and we'll start with uh Shade. yeah i think my biggest piece of advice is you know what you know so go out there and like fight for that job that you want because you might be like mm, i'm a little underqualified for this and I don't know that I should apply, apply anyways. You should just do it, take the leap, take the risk. Um, and most importantly, never stop learning. Take advantage of all of these resources we have. Um, I'm currently, I decided to do the um, Institute of Brewing and Distilling Diploma, which is um, an international uh, program where you can learn from a lot of brewmasters from all over the world. Uh, there's this one woman who's teaching right now from South Africa, and it's just like, the coolest opportunity to just to get a slightly even more in-depth um, education than like you'll get. Um, I mean, Sean, you're wonderful, but like, you know, like just learning from as many people as you possibly can is like the key to success. Um, we always are finding new ways to do things, more effective ways to do things. Uh, so don't close the door uh, when you leave UNC, keep it open and just keep seeking knowledge. Um, the thing that I'm the most excited about in the beer world is, is kind of, it's a selfish answer, but I'm, I'm very excited that what the recipe that I wrote for Peculiar is almost done being, uh, being carved. And so we'll be releasing it in two weeks. It was uh, the beer utilizing the uh, annual Pink Boots hop blend. It is a Pilsner. Yes, I dry hopped a Pilsner. Um, you can fight me with, I don't care. I did it and it was fun and it tastes amazing. So um, that's coming out soon. I'll make sure to let you all know when it's out, but I am just so excited to be like, I made this, I saw it through and it, it's going to be awesome. Um, and if it's not awesome, please tell me how to improve it, but I think it's going to be awesome. So I'm personally really biased, but yes. <laughs> I don't know about dry hopping a Pilsner. I've had dry hopped. Mm, this, why do you mess with something that's perfect? Anyways, we'll we'll go over and, and same questions to Jeff. So go to career services and get help with your resume and don't put your picture on it. Keep your resume down to one page and be involved. When we do a posting, we get a ton of resumes and, um, we want to know why you're passionate about our industry. This is, this is a lifestyle. This is a, an opportunity to be in a, a very tight brother and sisterhood. And we want to know why you want to be here. So that resume is your first handshake into the commercial realm for me. Um, what's exciting is uh, this Friday, we're releasing our Pilsner, our Czech Pilsner. And yes, Sean, we did also dry hop another version of it because any good cold IPA starts with a phenomenal Pilsner and a great hop. So good job. Sunday, I expect to have a little sample of that beer. Um, but uh, yeah, we're uh, releasing a lot of new product lines that I'm really excited about to just share because at the end of the day, I love my job. I love what I do. I don't even have a job. I show up to work and I get to play in a brew house with phenomenal people and talk to really cool people that drink my beer. And I love sharing, but uh, yeah, join our team, get that career path set up and get that job resume nailed down, please. Thanks. And thanks for having us today. Every, on my, every resume I do from here on out, I'm going to put something in there about how disappointed I am when people dry hop Pilsners, but all right, we'll we'll go to uh, Sarah next, and then I'll I'll finish of finish off the the round of questions. Uh, the round of questioning here. 
Um, yeah, my advice would kind of piggyback off of everyone else so far. Um, keep educating yourself, keep learning, go to other breweries if they're having sensory courses, go and meet other people there, learn what they're doing. If you can join collab days, join collab days, learn different brew systems, um, see what really the industry has to offer as a whole. Um, and networking is so important and don't don't lose those connections either. Try to keep them, keep them alive. It's been so great to have um, a continued connection with Sean, um, Dr. Mosher. Um, I've been able to do a collab with Dr. Mosher at one of my breweries before, so that was awesome. Sean just visited one of my breweries. Um, keeping up with my classmates has been great because I run into them, I see what they're doing. Um, just keeping those connections alive is really important, I think. Um, and not to disappoint Sean, but I also um, just made a dry hopped Pilsner recipe. Um, so I guess that's three for three to disappoint him. Bye, Sean. Um, but um, that it was really great. It was an awesome opportunity. It was a Pink Boots collab similar um, to Chade's. Um, so many women came together. A woman from California flew for this brew day. So that was like amazing that someone from LA flew to Denver just to brew a beer with the rest of us. Um, something that I'm looking forward to coming from Denver Beer Co that comes out today for opening um, opening day um, for the Rockies is a Cracker Jack beer. So if you like Cracker Jacks, this might be up your alley. I don't love Cracker Jacks, but the labeling and marketing behind it's super fun. I'm gonna. I'm. 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 I, I'll admit defeat. Apparently, apparently, it's a popular thing. I. I don't have to agree with it, but I'll admit defeat on the dry hopped pilsner um, front. I do have a question that came in for you, Jeff, um, which is asked: What is more important when starting a company, focusing on the brick and mortar or the distribution to liquor stores and bars? Uh, the very first thing that I would suggest any entrepreneur to do is. Uh, the brick and mortar, uh, I would personally start with a business plan and make sure it's solid. Um, having a, a, a somewhat gray idea of how you're going to get from point A to B. And I say gray idea because you won't have a crystal clear idea because I still don't have a crystal clear idea. Um, but being able to focus on the brick and mortar and ask questions to yourself, um, how much do you want to produce? What is your goal? Uh, the distribution network will come at its own pace. You don't have to get into distribution. Uh, the tap house craze, when I started the brewery in 2006, you had to distribute. Now I see successful breweries just run a tap house. Um, but knowing your layout and how much beer your goal is to produce will really tie you into how large of a facility do you need? Uh, how much capital investment you're going to have to put into structural assets? Um, and then if you want to get after the distribution channel, uh, liquor stores are uh, an easier barrier to entry to sell to first before draft accounts. And when I first started, that was opposite. Um, but being able to get your canned or bottled products to liquor stores uh, that sell like craft products, that's a key, um, is really plan B in the overall side of the, the, the business model. I hope I answered that question for you. All right. Um, well, I don't see any other questions uh, open, so... Um, I want to say thank you to everyone as I prepare to um, pass this back over to Lindsay, but thank you to Jeff and um, Shade and Sarah. Um, I guess my last little tidbit on the success of uh, students, because I didn't answer that, um, be passionate about what you're studying and then, you know, take advantage of the opportunities that are available to you as a student you're not gonna get a lot of opportunities to go and do internships and ask the questions that you can ask when you're a student. When you're just somebody looking for a job, it's a different world out there than when you're a student looking to learn. And I think a lot of people are really looking and, and willing to help people learn 
Um, and, and so utilize that time while you're at, at school and while you're doing your studies. But with that, I will uh, go ahead and pass it back over to Lindsay. Thank you, Sean, and thank you to our panelists. I particularly enjoyed the banter back and forth about the dry hops. I enjoy drinking beer. I do not know how to do the great work that all of you do. I am one of your consumers. And I have actually had many of your beers. Um, so thank you for doing an excellent job at providing a very delicious um, product. But also, I think the wonderful thing about the industry that you're all a part of is it is a very community-oriented industry. I know Jeff talked a little bit about that. And um, just the culture that um, beer houses and tap rooms um, and beer halls and beer gardens provide, whether you're consuming um, beverage or not, um, they really kind of become a, a part of our Colorado family um, and where people gather and have conversations and hear music and just enjoy one another's company. And so you're a part of um, one of a very unique industry. And I think that's one of the reasons why so many people are attracted to it right now and why we're proud that so many of our alumni are choosing to enter that industry. So thank you for sharing your expertise and insight today. Um, if you followed along in the chat, I did include some links, um, but for those of you that are recording, or for those of you that are watching the recording, um, the main link to know is visiting alumni.unco.edu. Um, on our career site, we have links to recordings for this and other resources to help you connect and put your UNC Bear Network to work. Um, thank you, finally, again, to our panelists. I really appreciate the time that you've shared with us today um, and for choosing to remain connected to UNC and to your Bear Network. Um, I agree with what Sean said that, you know, when you're a student, ask those questions, be inquisitive, because your alumni network is here to help you. They want to share with you what they've learned, um, the, <laughs> the ups and the downs um, to help you start and launch your career. So know that they are just an email, a call, or a LinkedIn click away. So with that, I hope everyone has a wonderful day, whether you're ending it with a beverage or whether you're just heading back to work. Um, thank you. And with that, I'll end by saying go Bears. Mm -hmm.